thanks everyone for joining this session. Uh, I, I'm also pretty happy to come back to RT Summit again. So I spoke last year and this year, uh, we'll talk about the evolution of Uber, uh, all about Uber. So about myself, um, I'm a principal engineer at Uber. So I lead the real-time data and search uh, area. Um, and I'm also a, a Apache Pino like a committer and PMC. So I will start with uh, like real-time antics at Uber, um, especially around like the Uber business. Um, so why this is important like for Uber? Um, there are three things we see that is very valuable like for Uber to use RTA. Like one is to gather real time um, and actionable insights. Um, so you can see on the screen left corner, like we have like a screenshot. So this is our um, product I call like restaurant manager. Like where we show this to you know our like restaurant like owners across the globe how they view their performance of their restaurants and then take some like, like actions. Uh, you can see like why the real time information is important for them because there are certain information like you know, if there are like all the orders in trouble or any like real time like signals that, emit, that requires some immediate action like from them. Uh, another category we call is like time sensitive like decisions. Like uh, in the middle is actually a good example which is our like fulfillment like workflows. Uh, you know, our like Uber by essential is like kind of like a matching business. Like we have like riders and we have drivers and then we want to like fulfill those kind of like requests. Uh, you can see that's highly depend on the real time like signals and data. So that's like why we need to like, like data come in be very fresh to make these kind of decisions. And lastly, we realized that like the real time information is very useful for improving the user engagement. So another example I show on the scorecard, which is we display to our free carriers that to show you know, some like real time like feedback uh, to their performance. So you know, given a tagline, our mission is that we want to provide like fast access uh, to fresh data at scale. So this is like why we want to build this like a platform. Um, and we name our platform, we call this like a EVA. Uh, and it's a consolidated RTA platform over Apache Pinot. This kind of architecture shows like our high level design. Um, and the, one of the keyword here is this consolidate, consolidated platform. And uh, in this talk, actually we'll walk through the journey uh, of Uber in the past few years about like our consolidation work. Um, and we started the like, platform in 2018. And uh, you know, at Uber, we tier our services uh, for this, like for their like importance and uh, reliability. So tier zero means like the most critical like platforms, uh, and uh, like this given the importance of this domain, like uh, this Ava platform is like tier zero. And surrounding the Apache Pino, we build all kinds of like components to improve user experience. For example, to provide this self-serve onboarding experience. Um, and we also made a lot of improvements over the, the, the CQ part for interaction uh, with the system. Like we build integration with the Presto, so user can use the Presto syntax for interaction. And also we are actually working on like a proxy so that our customer now can use like Pino SQL to directly for interaction. Um, and so across the platform, probably for all the use cases, like majority of queries can finish within 100 millisecond, and we provide like second level like a freshness that you know for our mission that we want to provide like fast access to uh, fresh data. Um, and in the past, I would say like like one or two years, we're also thinking about like the workloads beyond like traditional RTA, like not just like you know the real time like data signals, but we are looking into like other domains. Uh, for example. Uh, log analytics. So in the later session, I will talk about like our, our ongoing work that trying to use Pino to uh, do the, be the primary storage engine for our like logging platform. And on the other track, we are actively working on supporting like high cardinality uh, metrics in observability. So traditionally, like Uber has been using we call it like M3. Uh, which is like we open source like several years ago. But there has been like 
uh, a challenge uh, around supporting high cardinality metrics. Um, but you know, for certain use cases, is a, they do demand this kind of like support. And like one of the ongoing effort like we're doing is to you know support this and uh, using Pinot given the like like super strong like indexing type and support uh, so that we can like address this kind of like technical pains and enable those kind of like use cases. Um, and third, like interesting work we are doing is we call this like H type, which is like uh, it's called like hybrid transactional and analytical um, like like processing. So we are integrating with our um, online primary storage, like for example, uh, like Cassandra or MySQL, so that to bring to create like you know much better user experience, so that like people can query uh, both the transactional query also analytical query. So hopefully in the future, like RT summits, we can talk about this kind of work uh, and give uh, like more updates on those. Um, so you know, this talk is about like our consolidation story. And over the years, uh, we have done quite some consolidation work and working on multiple like technologies and then eventually like build into like a single like uh, platform over uh, Apache Pinode. So in this talk, I'll talk about like our journey with like RSDB, MemCQ, Elasticsearch, and Clayhouse. And one thing I want to call is that like, you know, we have, uh, um, like before we have like multiple technology and different use cases, like across the company. And our goal is trying to do more with less so that like, you know, with like one like uh, technology team that we want to make improvements to the technology itself, which in, in this case is Apache Pinot, and then trying to achieve like uh, feature parity, and so that we can like reduce our like, um, like uh, expertise on other areas, because that do, do require additional like engineering resources, so that it has a like a lean team, but also can like support like more use cases. This is kind of like our high level philosophy. So we will share some more the journey. Like the first one is RSDB. So um, RSDB is actually built open source by Uber in 2019. So one major setting point is that RSDB uh, like leverage like GPU. And the goal is trying to provide low latency ingestion and also like some fast query response. So back then, that's primarily used for powering the, some business metric dashboards. If you can see on the left, that's some other screenshots we had like many years ago, you know, like to show uh, like the uh, a heat map of like the um, the ongoing uh, like trips and also like the driver like density. Um, so, but like why we want to do the like consolidation? Like there are a couple of reasons. Like one uh, issue is that like RSDB uh, was not like distributed system. It's a, it's a single box, single machine. So there is like upper limit on how much data you can store there. And you can see like, like extending a single machine system into a distributed one requires a lot of like amounts of efforts. And in addition to that, like, you know, given back then, like there was like GPU was like pretty new. Um, and also it's built in like C++. But at that moment, like we did not have like too much C plus expertise, um, so you know um, at the leadership level, like we wanted like to, you know, address this challenge by doing this consolidation like with Pinode. Um, but you can see that actually there are several feature parities that we have to achieve, including like absurd functions, like dim table join, which are like a small like table can store in like one machine, and also some like geospatial features to be able to support our use cases. Um, and the team actually made those contributions to Apache Pinot. And over the year, we're able to bring artificial parity and then like sunset this technology. Um, so I would talk about another uh, use case around like uh, Elastic Search. Um, so you know, there are several use cases of Elastic Search Uber, but here I just try to highlight like a few ones and then trying to uh, like get the idea like, like why we want to do this kind of consolidation work. Um, so Elasticsearch was uh, also used by our metrics platform at Uber 
that for like monitoring and uh, for the marketplace, and also for critical decision making, right? So you can see this is actually a very important to Uber business because you know, the leaders and the ops, they actually watch for the real time signals to uh, track what's ongoing like, like in each city, right? So like if the metrics is not available, then like the ops will fly blind, right? Uh, another thing is like those kind of metrics also built into our applications. So as example, on the left hand side, you can see there's a screenshot and there's actually like a delivery estimate like time. That is also like some real time like signal used in our machine learning platform for better like, uh, like, like measuring. So this kind of like high level like architecture. So uh, you can see the uh, top layer is our um, like application layer. And the example I mentioned, like including our search pricing, um, our like, business dashboard for leaders and ops. And under that is the, U, the U metric platform. It's the standardized like metric like store, which includes both the real time and offline metrics. And underneath that is the storage engine part, like uh, used to be like Elasticsearch and then like uh, we spent like a couple of years migrating that to Pnode. So why want to do that? Um, you know, yes, actually started like very early in the, in the Uber, Uber days, it's like back in 2014. So at that time, like the, the, <clears throat> the volume of data is relatively small compared to what we have today. Um, and also it comes with several like off the shelf like functionalities like absurd, you know, it should be like, like aggregation and it was like scalable. Uh, however, over the years, as the amount of data grows, uh, like the, the metric platform engineers uh, did see several challenges on the rapidity side and also on the engineering cost side. Um, like for example, like they tried all kinds of like optimization trying to improve like Elasticsearch, but you know, due to the, like, the nature of this technology, and also we didn't have like, enough expertise to change Elasticsearch itself, then just by building surround this like, technology like, has its own limits. So, and then the, the, the platform team, which is like the Apple platform team, like we actually work with the metric platform team like, to look at what kind of like, features they need. And then we identify there are several key things, including like absurd, like backfill, and we use a Spark connector to like, you know, uh, not only to ingest data into Elasticsearch, but also to uh, like taking snapshot of Elasticsearch data into like Hive and Data Lake. And also there are like a nice column like support. So you can see for the year of this feature, other, other, other year we actually contribute this feature to Pnode to like achieve like a feature parity. Um, and both actually on the platform side and the application side, we have spent a lot of like efforts to, uh, to prepare for this migration because you know, reliability is definitely like on top of our mind and we want to achieve like safe migration so that we build a lot of like testing like framework uh, and trying to ensure like not only about the, um, the reliability front, but also we want to recheck on the query performance and the data quality uh, to ensure like this is like uh, like painless migration uh, for the metric platform users. And lastly, there's also um, quite some like performance tuning opportunities uh, that we identify through this journey because uh, with the data and understanding of those queries from the platform, we actually realize there are certain optimization that we can push down into the storage layer into the into Pino itself. So if you look at the GitHub history, we actually contribute quite a few you know, optimizations and functions to make those like query run faster. Um, so like, it took our, us about like, it'll be like more than two years to complete this like migration. Um, and we significantly actually improved the overall reliability by looking at this like on-call dashboard, and the number of alerts and the number of incidents um, and also we add additional like functionality, you know, with this like multi-region like setup, we can achieve like, you know, pretty fine grained control of the failover, um, like in case there's like, a, like a, the, the, the issues on the matrix table itself. Um, and also, you know, like we importantly unlock our business by 
uh, allowing like more users to onboard, like addressing the rap the scalability bottleneck, uh, and also importantly is that like we uh, bring a lot of simplicity to our to the metric platform side, that they were able to deprecate several customized systems and solutions built around the Elite Search, so that now it's become like a simpler platform, easier to maintain. Um, you know, due to the limited of time, I couldn't go into the details of this migration work. But last year, we actually gave a talk um, at the Data Council and to talk about how we scale um, this like uh, metrics-like platform uh, with a lot of like deep dive, interesting insights. Um, now I'm, I'm going to talk about our uh, consolidation like with MemCQ. Um, so there are also several other, uh, a few use cases on MemCQ. But here, today I'm going to highlight like one and perhaps the most important use case that we had. So which is like user like a uh, cohorting like platform. So, you know, um, this platform is mainly for the uh, segmentation and targeting uh, for our like, um, like marketing team. So you can think how like, you know, uh, the marketing team want to identify uh, the Uber users and how to start launch a uh, like campaign or, you know, send promotion to those group of people. Like for example, like we want to identify like people who are interested in you know, like fried chicken or people are interested in like healthy food. Then we need to like have this like knowledge and this information like based on the past like user uh, like ordering history or their preference. So this platform is in charge of like managing those. Um, and there are like, you know, um, quite some like challenges with this particular application um, that I will show in the next slides. So, you know, like the, from high level you can see uh, this platform includes like, like the data ingestion, right? So we're the, the source, like we collect from like CRM, we from like the, uh, the current like user history from the app action data. And then this data is ingested into the storage and the and back then is a, is a MemCQ. And uh, people run all kinds of analytical query to identify which other groups. Like for example, if I want to launch a champ campaign to say, hey, I want to target like in the West Coast, uh, like with eaters who are interested in you know like healthy food, then we are going to uh, from the storage engine we're going to retrieve like the the list of the candidates groups, and then we have also store the same piece of data in Cassandra for quick lookup which is given like one group ID, we want to retrieve the, the user IDs, which become the eventual, you know, the, the targets, uh, the targeting, um, so that we can send emails, you know, we can like push notifications in the app, or like send like text messages. So this is at a high level. Um, and, you know, initially this system was built on top like MemCQ like back then, but over years, the the cohorting platform team like realized some like challenges with this uh, solution. Uh, one is that like it actually have a significant operational cost. Uh, that here the operation is mainly from the um, the engineering team perspective um, at Uber who want to operate like this system. And also there was suffering from uh, some reliability challenges like uh, due to like limited knowledge about the, the system itself. Uh, and also you know like security has been. Uh, increasingly important since like Uber was a public company, so that there are also some like certain security concerns that like uh, the team had with the vendor, and then lastly is a, is that like there's uh, we this like not like open source technology, but but there was like a licensing with the with the, with the vendors, but you know if you look at entire Uber, there are actually um, not many use cases on MemCQ itself. So that means that this become like a silo. So that there's not too much cost sharing opportunities with other teams or with other like use cases on this solution. Um, so that's like, like the two to three years ago, the cohorting platform team engaged with our platform team and then we look into this, like, this problem. And then we realized that actually uh, there's some unique challenge with this use case at that moment, like Pino was not able to support. That was because uh, originally Pino was designed for a single table analytics, 
uh, which means like you run aggregation or you can run some like filtering on a single table, that is fine. But it didn't have the capability to join with other tables. Um, but that changed like you know last year where the community uh, added the support of distribute join with multiple stage uh, and a uh, multi-stage engine. This is really like a game changer for Pnode. And by the way, I know there's another going session about this topic, so I'm very grateful for people here <laughs> to attend this session. I know that center is very interesting. Um, but why this is important for this particular use case is that because like we, the, the platform team, actually uh, the cohorting platform team, they model their data in a such way that there are different actually entities. As you can see on the right hand side, you know, there's like a writer entity and uh, there's also, you know, like for the iter, another entity. And they share some of the common keys, uh, which is the, the customer like UUID. Uh, but you can see like both of these tables could be pretty large, right? So uh, that means like we couldn't do like, you know, a combination of this into like one table. Uh, we had some attempts on that approach before, but we realized actually that was too challenging and also is not our elegant solution. So, um, so we were actually contributed and collaborated with the community on this multi-stage engine. And moreover, we actually contribute a call, feature called a co-located join. Um, so the idea is that we still want this like join to be cheap. So we want to avoid data shuffling. So to be able to do that is that we want to partition the table, table, tables in the way that you know, for the data with sharing the same uh, like primary key will be grouped together into like one server. So that like when the join happens, all the join can happen locally without like data transferring over the wire into other servers. Um, so we can still achieve like very low latency for this kind of like uh, use cases, which is a must have. Um, and this kind of like shows the timeline of this like transition. Um, so it's like quite a lot of efforts from like both teams in making, uh, for making this happen. Um, and also uh, you can see like as part of that, you know, we, are the very first adopters of this colloquy join feature at Uber. Uh, and in fact, I think perhaps, you know, the largest scale like in the industry uh, for this particular like uh, multi-stage join. Um, so just to show some wins, right? So uh, for the gains after the, the migration. So, you know, first of all, we, this is important for cost saving because we like reduce annual like licensing costs on MemCQ and so that like we can they, they can use the in-house like platform we build at Uber. And also they're actually pretty good like performance gains uh, through this, this work. Uh, to call like several notable ones, like you know, 75% core latency reduction and 90% the page load, load time, which is what our end user they are seeing. So this is a substantial um, like improvements. And also this will address other concerns I mentioned earlier, like there's no like around the security and compliance part. Um, and uh, also the, the, this also have the opportunity for the Uber team to contribute this feature to the Apache Pinot for others to adopt as well. Um, so our engineer actually uh, last year also gave a deep dive on this topic uh, at the Uber Meetup. So I paste a link here if you're interested in this topic, you can also go there and take a look. Um, so our last consolidation is with uh, Clay House. Um, so for Clay House at, at Uber, its primary use is for logging, so a logging platform. We actually, we have a code name. Uh, so logging platform at Uber is called like Sawmill. And you can see in the early days, the logging, the Sawmill was built on top of log Elasticsearch, this ELK like, stack. And then um, like around like 2020, um, the team, like made a migration from like Elite Search to Clayhouse, and actually achieved like pretty good win. The the overall like footprint, uh, the cost dropped by fifty percent. Um, but you know like the the logging the log size grows as the company size grows, right? So you know this has been there like for like three years, and the logging team also realized that like it's a the cost saving. Um, and also performance, like they hit the challenges. 
Uh, that's when they actually engage with the, the penal team to look at like this problem to see if there are opportunities that like uh, make like improvements. So this shows the, the high level architecture um, on the design. You can see uh, one of the, some of the key differences that like um, the, on the, the, um, the storage engine part. So before there was um, like ingester to ingest data like into like clay house. But you know, because of like Pino natively supports Kafka, and now like we can we're able to like reduce or like remove this component, but directly like running data like, like from Kafka without this like ingester. Um, and uh, this like simplify this uh, overall architecture um, and also bring some interesting opportunity because like we have a pretty good domain expertise in Pinot. So the team actually look at several um, like interesting like problems like overlocking. Um, so you know last week there was uh, a Pino roadmap like meetup, and we actually talked about several innovations that we did and we are we're actually actively working on. Here I'm just hi highlighting like a few um, examples. Uh, one is that the you know Pino has been uh, analytical engine. But for the locking use cases, it actually has quite a few like text search and text match like functionalities, right? So, so, um, so but this was not like a strong strength for Pino in the past. Um, but last year we actually made a, quite of some like improvements on this front. Uh, so this is like give like one example that you know we actually contribute this like a real time text match um, like locking feature uh, that. This particular PR, like we improve this, uh, this text match like uh, latency with like ten x like uh, improvements and with like better accuracy. So we leverage the library from like Apache Lucene, and we did additional optimization. We introduced our like own uh, core analyzer to make this part like really fast. Um, another interesting work that like we're doing is for like better like log compression because you know cost saving is super important for the long use cases. Uh, we actually adopted like an algorithm that was originally published at like OSDI uh, and open source by the researchers. So the idea is if you look at the logs, there actually there's a common pattern like in the in the logs structures. Um, so on the right hand side, like you can see that like there's like timestamp and there's like some log information. And also, you know, there are certain like parameters, could be like numbers, uh, or could be like some kind of like timestamp strings. Um, but the pattern or the, the template is the same. It's just like you have so many like different like logs on the parameter side. So this is definitely like an opportunity to, you know, reverse engineering to identify this like common template and extract that. So this is the key idea of this like CLP, this log compression algorithm, where is that like by scanning this data during the ingestion phase, then we extract this like a common template, which is string, and also with a dictionary of like parameters, like the position and also the value. So with that, like we actually were able to achieve some amazing like compression ratios. Um, so you know, we, we published like one engineering blog which we test on the Spark log, we were able to achieve like you know, 169 uh, compression ratio. Uh, there's also one upcoming research paper, OSDI, like this year, like we talk about the work like we did over uh, the, the logging platform, um, like for this, like for this particular work. So, and now we're in the middle um, of migration and uh, we're targeting like close to the end of this year or next year to complete this so that to realize this kind of cost saving gains. Um, so lastly, I want to share some like learnings from this year, over the year, uh, that talk about some of our technology adoption like strategy, not only for this platform, but also like beyond. So one is that like, you know, we want to position our team like owning a domain but not just technologies. Like for example, like we say, hey, there's like RTA domain and there's like search domain. Um, so that you know, the, the, the team should look into 
like the problems in this domain, but just now, like say, to look at like the, some problem that technology can solve. Because technology can change, technology can evolve, can evolve, but this domains will be always there. Uh, the second like philosophy is that, like we want to maintain as few technology as possible, like per domain. So like you know for for like obvious like productivity and uh, like efficiency reasons, right? So we want to keep like lean team, um, but you know like trying to uh, like do more with less. And also importantly, we want to we realize that we want to reduce like the confusions to our customers, because for one. Domain. If you offer more than the options, the obvious customer will ask, "Okay, what's the right technology for me?" Right. So, like keeping like a fewer technologies also can help for this like customer engagement and support. But we also realize that like we want to buy or adopt technology when there's like strong like business needs, and when that happens, we want to conduct like a very formal evaluation, like to like different like angles to see like what, what like um, which choice like we should make. Um, and you know that means like temporarily we can have like additional technology if there are something the existing one at, at, like in the company that does not have, but you know uh, we also want to consolidate when it's ready, meaning we can add the feature track parity like to our primary technology, um, and but you know we still want to go with the principle like uh, of the second which want to maintain as few technology as possible. And lastly, it's like we want to commit to, you know, open standard, right? So we want to have a technology like where this like active community, um, and also um, so that we we call it like you know, external like like exchange, uh, so that you know we can leverage the community work. So just a bit more about the factors when I talk about the uh, the open source like adoption. So you know, internally we do have like, um, uh, like a formal template, and that includes like many criteria that like whenever we need to consider new technology, we will need to fill in. Uh, we evaluate many fronts, like including like the technology readiness to see what is current position like in the industry, like the is max scale, uh, the standard the security support, those kind of things, and also. We all have a section to talk about like what's the adoption risk. Uh, this includes that like for any technology we adopt, we have to spend efforts integrating this with our Uber ecosystem. So there there will be like efforts, engineer work spent on integration, on maintenance, uh, and also importantly, we try to minimize the lock-in risk. So that's why it's really important to choose technology that has like you know the the open standard like in the industry. And lastly, it's also like community like attributes uh, around the technology that you know we, um, for our philosophy is that like we want to commit to the, um, the open standard, and so that like we prefer the technology that has the you know very open like uh, license like modeling, and like merit based like governance model, so that our team can contribute to the open source technology and also be part of the community as well. So, yeah, that's my uh, last slides. Yeah, thanks, and any questions for me? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, curious if you've considered migrating other things to Pino. Specifically, I'm looking for machine learning uh, feature stores. Is, would it be possible to build one on top of Pinot? And have you thought about it? And what are the trade-offs and risks associated with that from your perspective? OK, so you're asking about the feature store specific do you mean like in machine learning the feature stores? Correct. Yeah. So like for that one, like we uh, did not consider or we have not considered. So one of the reasons is that we look at that the, the for feature store, we realize actually the data access pattern is actually um, like really high concurrency, so that means like a lot of like read throughput. So that's beyond like the pinot um, like uh, sweet uh, spots, I would say. That so we use different technology like for that purpose, uh, like within Uber. You said one of the migrations took almost two years, right? How do you keep up with 
constantly migrating technologies and also the meeting the business needs. Uh, sorry, I missed your first part. The you said one of the migrations took almost two years, right? Two years to complete the migration. Uh, you mean the tidy metric? Is that what you are... Yeah, I forget which migration, but from oh, one the database. Metrics. Yeah, the metrics, right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So how do you keep up with changing business needs and constantly in a migrating mode and still delivering on your business requirements? Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, sorry, it will be like breaking, so I, want to try, I hope I capture your question. So I, I thought that there are two parts. Like one part is, I think, about the, the, the metrics itself. Um, the second, I think, is like how we can ensure the migration like, without like, breaking or like, creating like, challenge to a customer. Right? That, that's, a, that's a pretty good question. So one is that like, for metrics, uh, there are two types of metrics in general. One is the business metrics, and the other is the system metrics. Um, so, so overall, we actually have a different platforms for this type of metrics. So the business metrics we call is like a U metric, which is um, mainly targeting for our like metrics that is so that those metrics actually can build into the applications, like powering like you know this dashboard for uh, the executives to and ops to view. Uh, the system metrics is is for observability. So that one, like today we we still use M3. Uh, it's just like only a subset of system metrics that demand like high cardinality that we, we use Pnode. Um, and uh, it's also true that if you look at for the business metrics, they're actually uh, like quite challenging work to, you know, to migrate and then we do not want to introduce any interruption to our customer side. Uh, so you know, the, the pain is migration is actually one of the major um, like requirements, like when we carry on this kind of like migration work. So there are some like thoughts. One is that before we conduct a migration, we want to really spend efforts looking at the, the feature parity, right? So, so that we need to know, okay, what are the features like we have to implement? And a lot of that actually we need to count on the, the testing. So that just for this part, we actually build infrastructure work that we will shadow the production query and we actually like measure and observe on different dimensions of these metrics, including like rapidity, correlatency, like freshness, even the results like parity. We do like a you know the parity check of the query results content to ensure like everything's on par, right? So that we are able to do like a, like a switch at runtime. And also a good thing is that like we can always we can actually switch back, like so that like you know we will roll out the new system. If there are like you know surprises, if there are like instability, we're able to switch back to old stack. So we only keep on the new stack running like in the healthy way for several months, and then we will say, okay, now this can graduate. We can sunset the old one. Uh, so you mentioned about large joints uh, using pinos, like uh, using large tables with the joints. So how big are these large tables? And my second question is basically you also also mentioned about upsets. Mm. How big are these upsets, and uh, how frequently do you do those? In yeah. Pino? Okay, those are good questions. So for for join, I would say right now our primary use case on join is the co-located join, like I mentioned, right? Because from the the technical perspective, we know this join will be fast, and also we know that you know the multi-stage like join capability is, is pretty new. So I think it, it takes time to, you know, to iterate, optimize, and refine. And we're actually actively working with the community on that front. Uh, another thing is like, you know, for the join role at, at Uber internally, we'll be, we want to be very careful, mainly from the reliability concerns that we do not want like a few ad hoc expensive query to degrade the entire cluster, right? So this could be a common challenge. So that means, like you know, today our work with like we actually have engagement with our customers and try out some POC to see how that performance. Like if it's okay, then okay, like we can we can onboard this. So we kind of like taking this kind of like a law list like approach for those join. But you know, hopefully, like this join feature in the upcoming months or year can be more mature and also there like you know cost admission efforts. Uh, all feature can be added to the open source to better protect the system for this kind of like situations. Um, and regarding your uh, question on the absurd, so 
like for our observations, like we have probably like one third or one fourth of the use cases that require absurd. Um, but also interestingly that those use cases actually are critical and important use cases. So, uh, which I believe like because people care more about accuracy, so then, you know, this is like more important from the business perspective. So, you know, we, we did like treat like absurd like, um, it will be like especially, you know, we have a dedicated like tenant for the upstairs like tables. Uh, and also because of the memory like usage and therefore the, the longer restart time. So on the operation side, that will also be like the careful and then have a certain like run books for those upstairs tables. So you mentioned high cardinality, cardinality metrics. What is constitutes that from your perspective? Like what kind of time series? Yeah, so, so I think one, um, I think interesting example is that what we do today is that actually we want to um, generate the metrics and alerts like for our end customers. Like for example, you know we have lots of like merchants and restaurants in the world, and like if they're like metrics like job, for example, the number of orders, right? So let's say each day they should expect like you know five or 10 orders like per like, you know, hour or something. But if there's a sudden drop something, like we, we want to like alert them. So the, this metric is actually determined by the number of like restaurants or merchants, right? So we have like millions of them. So this is like constitutes like high cardinality. So that's one example. Another example is like there are metrics we put on like UUID. So to detect the UUID churn because like for the same like item in the catalog, that we identify there are cases, you know, when the the vendors like each day, like when they, they will like rescan or re ingest some data. But then for the same item, they may assign a different like UUID, right? So to identify this kind of like churn is actually like important because you don't want different reference of the same entity like in right. So that's some of key metrics that we use and we monitor as well. Thank you very much for talking.